And welcome to Footy Talks, presented by Powerade and MLS Cup Preview Edition. We'll look back on the season awards as well in Major League Soccer. Luke and KJ with you, the penultimate episode of this year's Footy Talks. So one more to come next week as we wrap up the whole season. And who knows, by then, uh, Caldwell might actually have found some Wi-Fi in the Bahamas or wherever it is, whatever yacht he's on right now, or <laughs> I'm not sure. But hopefully Stevie will be with us to, to wrap up the whole year next week. Uh, but a couple of great guests, KJ, as we look ahead to MLS Cup with the man who will call it uh, the feed on Fox will be taken here in Canada on TSN. So Do John Strong will be joining us. And the one and only Dero, one of the 25 greatest that was named by Major League Soccer this week in celebration of the league's 25-year anniversary. Jovinko was in there, Dero as well. Um, so it'll be great to chat to, to both John Strong and uh, to Dero as well today. Yeah, really excited for both guests. Obviously, we're here, we're, 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 pre we're previewing the final, and I know a lot of fans here in Canada are not happy that their teams are not in it, but it is a big game. It's a big game for our, for our league that we all love. Uh, two teams that deserve to be there and a chance to watch those teams shine again. And, and you know, if you're a club, that you're obviously not supporting any of those teams. So you want to look at that team and think what the kind of standard they're at. It's coming to the end of the year. We're excited. We've got a final to look forward to. We didn't think we'd have that chance to do that. And of course, it'd be great to catch up with Dero, who is, of course, speaks for himself, a Canadian soccer legend and TFC connections. And interested to hear his thoughts on his selection to be the top 25 and talk to him about all the stories that are going to be coming out in his book next year. So it should be a good one. Before we get to, to that and also to uh, the MVP award this week with Alejandro Pozuelo and the, the Humanitarian of the Year Award in Major League Soccer, which of course Justin Morrow was heavily involved with, with Black Players for Change. Um, I want to just kick off with the latest that you know, KJ, on the TFC search for, for the new head coach, because that's what a lot of people will be tuning in, wanting to hear about. And, uh, you know, Whenever a manager goes anywhere around the world, there are always names that get suggested and mm -hmm. uh, names that get reported. We mentioned last week, some of them come from agents who are trying to get their clients front and center. Um, there were reports yesterday of a couple of big names, Patrick Vieira and Laurent Blanc being considered. Um, first off, KJ, uh, before we get to whether those names are even, you know, maybe on the list or uh, what you think of them and their, the, the way they fit with TFC, um, do you know anything about where they're at in terms of this search right now? Well, I know they're still open to discussions about having people come in and have an opportunity that I don't believe from what I'm hearing that they've closed the book right now on the application process. It is a process that I know that they want to take a great deal of time on and, and take some and get some clarity over. You know, I do think it's been a hard year and they need to do that. You know, some of the people that are making these decisions have been in quarantine until yesterday. If you can imagine that, they were still quarantining from their trip in the United States. So it's not, it, it hasn't been something that they can collaboratively get together in person about. Uh, so I think that's, that I do know that that's delayed the process as well. Um, some discussions are taking place with some of the potential candidates this week. Um, obviously, as you said, some agents are dropping names out there and some of them are true and some of them aren't necessarily true. Um, you know, the Ben Olsen one, I think, was a little bit of a reach. Uh, and, you know, the two names that came out yesterday are interesting ones. You know, they're obviously big names in terms of the overseas um, stature. Uh, you know, Patrick Vieira from I spoke to somebody in Europe this week who told me that they would be surprised if Patrick decides to come to MLS at this time. And, um, you know, this this man knows Patrick quite well. I don't know Patrick, but so we'll see. And, it, you know, I just think for me, Patrick Vieira has obviously just come off a job. He just recently lost his job at Nice. It wasn't necessarily the trajectory that he wanted to go on. He was obviously a man within the City group when he was over here and had aspirations, I think, with Manchester City Football Group that they wanted to go, maybe go there and be a Pep Guardiola replacement. He diverted to a different spot with Nice that had a number of different turnovers and changes of ownership and executives there. That was a difficult time. So we'll see whether he decides to pivot back to MLS. I think if he does, it would be, I think it would be, I think every club in Major League Soccer would have an interest in talking to Patrick, you know. Um, so we'll see. But from what I'm hearing right now, that that's right now that hasn't happened at the moment. The other one, Laurent Blanc, uh, completely um, somebody, somebody who obviously has plenty of experience uh, on the pitch and off it as well, but hasn't been, um, in terms of uh, recent managerial experience, hasn't been um, in involved with any clubs um, over yeah. the last couple of years at, at all. You have to wonder as well, uh, it's always the big... It's always the big question with regards to whether you are bringing somebody in for what they've accomplished or what they um, can do 
um, in terms of coaching and in terms of managing a team or if you how much that lack of MLS experience plays into it or if you're looking for somebody who knows the league can come in hit the ground running isn't going to need the hand holding in terms of all the roster moves and all that sort of stuff that that goes around with a very unique league in Major League Soccer and we, we actually talked about this a little while ago that I think it was the episode we had Peter Vermees on the show when you look at the people that have been successful this year and you look at the teams in the final with Caleb Porter of Columbus, who has has been in North America, um, involved in the North American game at the college level and the pro level and won it with Portland and is now in Columbus. You look at Brian Smetzer, who's who's been involved in North America all his life in the game here and, and has won it with Seattle before and is a long term stable coach there in this environment. You look at Greg Vanny, who just left TFC, who'd mm. been there for six years, Peter yeah. Vermees. You know, Adrian Heath, even, although he came over from England initially, uh, did yeah. the work at the lower level. Absolutely. Knows, knows the league, knows what it's about. Um, there are a lot more of those coaches around than the ones that are coming in and just dropping in and being successful. I mean, even Gary Smith in Nashville, coming back in from England, he, he'd he done the work and, and been there with Colorado back in 2010. Yeah, all great points, Luke. And I think there's too many of them to say that it's just simply a coincidence. I think there's something to it. You know, there's no doubt about it. I'm not saying that Laurent Blanc or you name it, any, you name, you know, Marco Silva, any of these coaches couldn't come and make a difference. I just think that for me, it is a big factor. It makes what it makes Major League Soccer extremely unique. We've seen Schilotto, who got to the Copa Libertadores final and was one of the best managers in South America, who really struggled to connect in Los Angeles, do whatever he could. Alonso, two time CONCAF Champions League winner, albeit only one year, but that Miami thing is already starting to come off the rails with a couple of executives leaving that team this week as well. Uh, so, yeah, I'm with you. For me, it comes down to this you know, when you run an organization, and this is just not in sports, for me, it's vital that you provide that no excuse mentality. You have to take on responsibilities for everything. And I think that when you bring in that coach, they need to know that you can't allow those excuses to come in. Oh, yeah, so we got to fly to the West Coast in three days. Or, oh, no, we've got to do this again. Or we're not going first class. And it's like, what's the problem here? Or, why can't you go get me a wingo? I was like, why can't this kid play from the academy? Well, he's not allowed. He's not part of all these different questions that other people have asked. Remy Gard's been through it in Montreal. We've, we've spoke to many of them. Aaron Vinter here. Um, it well, is, I was it, just going to say, KJ, even, unique, you know? even Aaron Vinter and everything that went on in the first few weeks of his reign with TFC in terms of not wanting to let reporters into the locker room following the games, just things like that, that make, you know, it, it's not smooth. That's it's right. not a smooth transition and it, and it leads to um, very bumpy waters very early on in, a, in somebody's reign as a, as a head coach. Yeah, it's, it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary hurdles that get placed up as, again, back to that point, what I said about being you know, just being adamant about what's taking on the responsibility. This organization, if we're speaking about Toronto FC in particular, this organization is ready to succeed now. This is not a transition. This is somebody who needs to, they need to come over here now and be on the same page. Somebody who understands the city, the club, the presence, what it takes in the city and the players. And it can't set them back by giving somebody six to nine months of a bedded in period, a benefit of the doubt factor will come in after that. You need somebody who comes in now that knows it. I'm not saying that the manager has had to manage an MLS, but I think there has to be some kind of connection there at some point to have had them to, to understand what that's about. You don't want the players guiding the manager. You need the manager like guiding the players. Uh, and, I, and I think that all the points you make, the fact that here we are again, Caleb and, and, and Brian in the final, um, and Vanny has been there, and there's been so many examples of that. I do think there are examples that could combat that. I think Ronnie Dyler, what he's doing, I think he's a great example of what he could become, something like that. He's shown great patience and ability to, to learn and has come over here and I think has been quite successful in New York. There are examples of that. I'm not saying that, that obviously there's one rule for all, but it does appear that, as I said, there's a lot more than, you know, the, 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 the makes it just a coincidence for me with the North American coaches. Uh, do let us know where you're listening or watching to us today. Uh, we'll we'll give you a shout out wherever it is around the world. Thanks for joining us here on Footy Talks. Uh, before we get to John Strong, um, Alejandro Pozuelo, the MLS MVP, uh, that was expected. Um, the more important award this week, in my mind, was uh, Justin Morrow's uh, group, Black Players for Change. Justin Morrow, Toronto FC, uh, playing a huge role this year as the executive director of Black Players for Change. And until it came out, KJ, on the morning, I know you had the chance to speak to Justin Morrow this week. Yeah, I voted for him as the humanitarian of the year. It had never even crossed my mind that it wouldn't be an individual, that it would be given to the group. But 
in the end, it seems to it just makes so much sense, KJ. And, and listening to Justin Morrow, that's exactly what he wanted. And um, it was not about individuals at this point with what they've, they've done no. so far and what they're trying to achieve. No, it goes against the entire message that they're trying to put in, that send out there. I had a pleasure to chat with Justin for eight or nine minutes this week about it. We know Justin a little bit. The fans can certainly relate to Justin Morrow here on with TFC. He would never come out and say it, but I think he's okay with us saying it, that he would not have wanted to win that award. You know, it just wouldn't, it goes against everything. You know, when I voted for Justin and Mark Anthony Kay and Jeremy Abobasi were there, and I've I've interviewed both, all three of those this year. They've all made up, I was like, Oof. okay, yeah, Justin, okay, because of his executive director, the connection, with, he's so good to us. But it, it did feel a little bit uneasy, and I'm, I'm with you. The Black Players Change should win the award. And it, as he said to me, they're not in it for validation. They're not in it for trophies, really. But it is just an expression and a symbol that the recognition that they've done and Major League Soccer recognizing that. And we're all going forward now to work on this. It's, you know, 2020 has been a tough year for a lot of people. But how can we make positives out of it? That's one, no doubt about it. That Zoom call that 70-plus black players were on six days after the, the, the awful tragedy of the death of George Floyd – will stick with those players forever. Subsequently, the message that they sent them with 170 of them with all standing there in unity at the beginning of the MLS's back tournament, images that will stay with us as broadcasters and fans and lovers of this league forever, and they should. And uh, this is just the beginning. I'm so proud of that group and what they've done, and uh, let's keep let's keep moving forward and giving them a platform to talk and, and work on this as much as we can because it's so important. We'll get to Alejandro Pozuelo and the MLS MVP a little later on, but it is MLS Cup week. Um, a very strange season ends in Columbus. Uh, Columbus crew getting set to take on Seattle Sounders. Delighted to be joined now on Footy Talks by John Strong, the voice of Major League Soccer, the voice of soccer in the United States. Here he is. Um, how are Howdy, you, boys. Hey, John. J just whiskey in this, by the way. No comment. Oh, of course. It will be your voice that everybody hears uh, north of the border here. Uh, TSM will be taking the Fox feed this weekend on Saturday night from Columbus. So um, it's great to be joined by you. Appreciate you giving the time today as you're about to fly in. Um, I know it's been, it's been a, a weird year for everyone, but um, at least when I was calling games in studio this season, I had Stephen Caldwell, usually it was, to my side. I know that a lot of the time this year, you weren't even in the same city as the person you were calling games with. What's that been like? Uh, incidentally, you brought up Aaron Vinter in 2011. I was there when he had his first freak out about journalists coming into the dressing room because it was a game against Portland, but that's a different yeah. story for a different time. Um, yeah, that's been interesting. So when we did the MLS's back tournament, I, I lived in a hotel in L.A. for a month. And then the first few weeks after that, I was commuting back and forth to L.A., trying to figure out a place where I live in Portland where we could get it set. And honestly, the biggest thing that I, I pushed Fox on was I said, you know, we got my my son doing kindergarten from his bedroom and, and our daughter's running around like I can't be going back and forth for these games. And so, yeah, we, we found a little setup in Portland. Um, it, it's in an office building. So when we did the U.S. men's games uh, in Europe the other week, they had to warn the other tenants in the building there's going to be a guy shouting for about two hours in the middle of the day if you're on a business call. I'm not making that up. You know, and uh, yeah, it's it's very different. I think the benefit we had, Stu and I have been doing this for five years together. We started with NBC. People might remember watching those NBC games where the analyst was actually on the field at a little yes. podium, sort of like yeah. the between the glasses thing in hockey. Yeah. So I have experience doing that. He did a few of those games. We had a little camera feed where we could see each other um, and sort of get that eye contact, although there was a bit of a delay. It was very imperfect. Um but that's the, the point of this year, right? It's going to be imperfect. You got to roll with it. You got to find your way to do it. You have to make it seem like everything's normal. And the best compliment that, that we could get from people was, I had no idea you weren't in the same place. I had no idea you weren't at the game. Perfect. Good, good for us. Happy to take that. It's great that people don't know that. But we don't want to get too used to it. because Exactly. We don't want to be too good. <laughs> I want to make one mistake each game. Exactly. Yeah, that's the thing. Because I saw you in Seattle on Monday night. And I saw, I mean, Luke and I will talk about this the same thing. Luke and I are often like, we're both there with our cups of tea. We love our Starbucks. And we love that city. So yes. like when I saw Rob and Alexi high up and I could see that stadium, I'm not going to lie, my heart was like full. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is immense to see this. And then obviously you guys are in the stadium. So what was that like getting back there? Obviously, we'll, we'll talk about the match itself, but that was a magnificent instant classic. But just to be there, I know no fans, but in that city's magic and then just to be in the stadium as well, John. 
Yeah, I mean, that was big. And I think it's 11 consecutive years, at least, that I've called a game in that building and even in the playoffs, for that matter. So it's a very familiar place for me. Um, It was different without fans. But again, it's sort of like calling a game off a monitor. And you guys have done this enough. Once you're into it, you sort of forget. You you sort of forget the fans aren't there. Um, And and they pipe in a little bit of just almost like just a background noise that they pipe into the to the public address. We have our enhanced crowd audio that, that just sort of comes in a little bit just so it's there. And I think it's actually the biggest compliment to what the Sounders accomplished. Uh, Their post-game radio show was making this point. Normally, a team that would come back from two goals late and win a game like that 3-2 at home, we'd say, oh, the fans, they pushed them on, they gave them the energy. Well, they didn't have that. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to sort of generate that energy and that emotion ourselves. But absolutely, it was huge to be there. I am... I'm excited for those elements of being in Columbus as much as there are extra hoops to jump through and extra precautions to take in a part of the country. I mean, what part of this country hasn't been hit hard right now, but Columbus in particular. But there is nothing that replicates being there, seeing it with your own eyes, feeling that emotion, transmitting that emotion to the viewer at home. And and as ever, you know, we're going to do our best when we're not there. Uh, when we are there, it's it's a lot easier. And, and we were so thrilled that the game lived up to us, you know, being able to to be there in person. Obviously, it would have been much better if it was a Toronto-Seattle final once again, but uh, it says some people. Other people would disagree with that. But yeah, <laughs> Some people have got sick and tired of it, that's for certain. But for, for the way the story goes, and I had the opportunity for TSN to chat with Caleb Porter yesterday, uh, for him to come into the place where he won MLS Cup with Portland back in 2015, uh, with a side that was almost gone and re- out of the league and gone to Austin two years ago, um, with a team that is probably playing, you know, the final big game in in a stadium that has meant so much to U.S. soccer down the years. He talked about winning there in 2015. He talked about winning there as an assistant coach with Indiana. I think it was 04. Um, and you know, he's, he's always very stoic, Caleb, and he said, you know, it might, he, it might, he might reflect on it a bit more afterwards. But you know, this is a it's a huge deal for Columbus and for U.S. soccer as a whole, isn't it, John? Yeah, and that, that's really neat. As much as I think coming into the playoffs, we thought, oh, you know, Philadelphia making cup, wouldn't that be something? I mean, can Toronto overcome all these incredible challenges? I mean, I mean, we did the game with Nashville, and they just sounded tired when we spoke to them the day before. They just sort of, I mean, just worn down, and you understand why. Um, and even the Reds, you know, New England making that charge. I mean, man, is this Bruce Arena going back to the mountaintop? I love Columbus being in this game. As you rightly said, I think Columbus... And that stadium, that's the American Azteca. That's the American Maracanã. That's the American Wembley, um, even though it is a dump, objectively. And, and it needs to be replaced, but it's got great history. <laughs> and, and so it's fun being back there. It's a chance to bring the curtain down. As you mentioned, we were I remember that being in Toronto, actually, the 2017 conference final. And it was a month or two after it word first leaked out that Anthony Precourt was seeking to relocate the team. And we're sitting there with Greg Berhalter and the players, and they're all saying it's like a real life version of the movie Major League that we're living yeah. right now. Um, they found that committed ownership. Greg Berhalter goes to the U.S. Caleb Porter needed a year off from his time in Portland, got that recharged in South Carolina, of all places, and, and ended up coming back into this job. I remember talking to him last year, and he said, we're bad now. This is a bad year. Uh, but we're going to be better because we're going to remake this roster. We're going to get guys healthy and just watch out for us. And that's exactly what's happened. And they've withstood. It could have been easy for the wheels to come off when they went down against the Red Bulls. Could have been easy for the wheels to come off going to extra time with Nashville. They've had as many as six players unavailable with positive COVID uh, tests. Another player has been added to that list as they get some back this week. They've had very little abilities to be together in practice in recent weeks because of all of that. And they've just stayed steady. And, and I think Caleb Porter deserves a lot of that credit. Um, he's a guy that engenders some strong opinions. Um, he's a divisive figure, even within the coaching ranks sometimes because of his personality. But the dude's a winner. Um, he won in Akron. He, you mentioned Indiana, his success as an assistant coach. He won in Portland where they hadn't had success before. He took over a successful infrastructure, the Greg Burhalter building Columbus, and, and has pushed it back now to MLS Cup. And the thing that's interesting about Caleb more than any other coach I've been around, he, at the very least, will talk about how much he game plans for an opponent, how much he tailors his team approach to a game to finding whatever it is the other team does well and to take that away. And so he is going to be game planning specifically for Seattle beyond the things that Columbus does well. And that adds a fun little tactical element here. These are two coaches that know each other well, are very competitive on an individual level against one another, 
are very aware of the big picture stakes for, for them as individuals and for their clubs. And we'll have put an endless amount of time and energy since what Monday night, I guess, preparing for this battle against one another to try to come out on top. And it adds a lot of really fun layers to what we're hoping is going to be a very good game. Yeah, I hope so too. John, on the other side, Seattle, obviously you were there for what was a remarkable comeback. This is a team for me that has just raised the bar every year. Different level, different standard. I know on this show, Toronto FC fans feel like that they played a big part in that and they at one point were at the top, but Seattle have gone above that and gone and gone another level for me. The one thing I would say, it'd be interesting to hear your take on having watched the three finals. The one thing that's probably missing from them is an outstanding performance in a final. Would you admit? Because the 16 game obviously could have gone either way. They defended brilliantly and they won on penalties. And I know people don't want to hear it on here, but they did deserve to win it because they won it on penalties. 2017, they just didn't show up and were outplayed significantly. And even last year, they won the game and deserved it in the second half, but were outplayed for an hour. Do you feel that this group will think about that, that they'll want to go out there and set their mark on a final that maybe this era deserves? Yeah, I think to a certain extent, I, I think, first of all, very rarely are finals good games. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do teams have their best performance of a season in a final. That's just the nature of, of being here. And it's, it's not an MLS thing. It's just soccer globally. Yeah. Um, and so and, and listen, has Seattle really played their best even in the playoffs? I mean, against LAFC, yes. Against LAFC, it was like, oh, my goodness, what these guys are doing. That was a heavily, heavily depleted and understrength LAFC team. They weren't great against Dallas. They got the goal they needed. Brian Schmetzer told us as much last week. That was a down day for us. We did what we had to do. Um, they, they were very deservedly down 2-0 with, with 20 minutes to go against Minnesota. Minnesota were playing great, and they were able to change the game, ride their momentum. They got individual plays. And it's interesting that you look at the goals that have been scored. You know, Will Bruin off the bench, Gustav Svensson off the bench, mm -hmm. Shane O'Neill a center back. It hasn't necessarily been that front three, Rui Diaz, Lodero, and Morris just carving teams apart with the exception of that stretch against LAFC. Now, to, to, to the point of your question, Christian, I don't think they really care. I think they care about the trophy more than anything else. But absolutely, if you start thinking about if they win, how would they compare to the DC United of the 90s? How would they compare to the LA Galaxy of the early 2010s? Being able to play Columbus off the park as compared to scrape through on one key moment, I think makes a difference in that retelling. Are they able to do it against a good Columbus team? Are they able to do it on a field which is going to be soaking wet? It's going to be raining all day. The question right now is whether it's going to be raining during the game or not. Very windy as well, Saturday night. Those are all elements to it. But absolutely, this is... These games are where you make your legend, right? And I mean, Stefan Fry is a legend because of his moment in MLS Cup 2016 as much as anything else he's accomplished. So if a Jordan Morris or a Nico Ladero does something truly special, and if they as a team do something truly special, it, it lifts, it elevates the accomplishment, no doubt. Each week on the show, we have the Powerade power play of the game. And uh, this week, there's one huge moment in Major League Soccer. Uh, you were fortunate enough to be able to call it on Monday night. It was the 3-2 goal uh, for Seattle as they overturned that. So that is our Powerade power play of the game this week. Uh, producer Kev will share it on the screen. Uh, John, just talk us through what's going through your mind here. Having seen the Sounders come back from 2-0 down to make it 2-1 and then 2-2 right at the end. And you, you're calling this in, in stoppage time here. And if anything, I, I sort of blew this whole sequence because I was, I think, and long story short, I got myself too caught up in the minutia. Late on, and I'm trying to sell, and I'm trying to do all these things, and I didn't do a good enough job of what Martin Tyler told me years ago. Just watch the game. And so, as Ladero's setting up to take, I'm actually, I'm fumbling through, you know, I think I called him Louis Diaz or something like that, because it's just getting so chaotic. And then Svensson gets to that. It's a, it's a, it's a mirror image of the goal they scored against RSL in last year's playoffs. And the best thing is you can hear the squeal. I don't know what player it is, but before that ball's in the back of the net, there's a, there's a high pitched squeal <laughs> that comes from one of the Sounders players. I thought that was actually, you, John. <laughs> I know. It sounds like it, it actually covered my voice up. It was pretty funny. It might've been Stu for all I know. <laughs> And you see the joy, you see the emotion. And, and that was something I think that we wondered coming into these playoffs at the end of a weird year with no fans. Are these guys going to care? Is it going to matter the same? And we saw it the opening night of the playoffs with New England's goal against Montreal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it continued on Monday night. Like, it doesn't matter. to You know, these guys are professionals. They spent their life doing this. And so 
And that's part of the difference why Seattle's been as good as they have. They can get plays from anywhere on the field. Ladero's service is phenomenal. Svensson knows where he's going. The same as Shane O'Neill did. Uh, the same as Raul Rui Diaz did in the opening round. that He was able to pick up a second ball from those. And that's beyond, as we said, the way they can hurt you in open play with that front three. So it was a special moment. It was a crazy moment. It was it was an incredible comeback. The emotion from the Seattle coaches, I thought, was great to see the way they reacted. Um, you know, I I always go back to 2016 Toronto Montreal in the conference final. That's my favorite playoff game I've ever called. Nice. This does not go past that. I think because of the absence of the atmosphere, but it's a pretty darn close second for for a stretch at, at two nil at 70 minutes where we're like oh boy is this just gonna sort of you know slide into the station here and then things went crazy and both both of those games that you mentioned ended three two after 90 minutes we just happened to get 30 more minutes with the toronto right. montreal game so that, that certainly added to it as well um quick one last one for me john on ladero he it's it's hard not to think of him as being the the main man. I know Schmetzer took over at the same time. In fact, Schmetzer's first game was Ladero's first game, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and but it's Ladero's just a winner, is he not? And I look across the league right now and what Pozuelo's accomplished here at TFC and what Reynoso did the other night. You've got Zilla Ryan on the other side. These tens are, are carrying these teams. And I know that obviously we can talk about Rui Diaz and Morris and so many other people, but Nico Ladero is that culture setter, is he not for the Sounders team? You nailed it right at the end there, Christian. He is the culture setter. That's what Ladero does. Yes, the assists. Yes, the goals. Yes, the superlatives. He wasn't the first. I mean, Diego Valeri came before him. Javier Morales came before him. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think that was in the Minnesota press was, okay, we've got our Ladero now with, with Reynoso. But even more than that. So it wasn't just that his first game was Schmetzer's first game. Nico Ladero got on an airplane in July 2016 to come play for Ziggy Schmidt and the Seattle Sounders. The same Ziggy Schmidt that had won a title in Columbus with Guillermo Barrosquilotto as his MVP, who is now Ladero's coach at Boca Juniors. That was the connection. That was the key link that got Ladero on the plane to come to Seattle. By the time he lands, Ziggy Schmidt has been fired. Brian Schmetzer has been named the interim head coach that same morning. He could have turned around at SeaTac Airport and gotten back on the plane and gotten out of there. And instead, he came into this situation. There's the famous story of the first game. He comes into the locker room before kickoff. The music is blaring. He turns the music off. There's the other one we remember in MLS Cup that year. Brian Schmetzer was going through his order in the shootout, and he says, uh, Nico, you're second, you're third, you're and he goes, no, 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 I'm fifth. I go fifth. I'm fifth. He took control of the culture of this team. It was not an accident. He became the captain when Osvaldo Alonso left. It is Nico Ladero's team as much as it is any other individual on and off the field. And, and it's a really, for a guy that already had an accomplished career, played at a very high level, went through big ups and big downs, to have been able to have this theoretically closing act of remarkable success. And not that his odometer's running over too much anyway right now. Um it, it, he, he, you know, we just did the 25 greatest and it's subjective. And how do you figure that out? But undoubtedly, one of the most significant signings this league has ever seen. Yeah. And on a on a club that's had big players in Casey Keller and Clint Dempsey, et cetera, et cetera. Ladera might be the most and even Osvaldo Alonso. Ladera might be the most important Seattle sounder of all time because he took a good team and he made them great. I'm glad you bring up uh, MLS 25 greatest there because we're going to be joined by D-Row very shortly, John. But uh, I want you to break a tie here because um, KJ voted and didn't include David Beckham in his <laughs> top 25 greatest. Palmer well, just um, likes a good stir up. I didn't vote, but I would have. If I'd voted, I would have included David Beckham. Why didn't you vote he... then? You could have voted. You're, you're a big personality in MLS. Why didn't I you could, vote? I could have voted, but I two kids at home, you know, whatever. Um Anyway, John, did you vote? I did vote. I'm trying to find. I, it was like two months ago. I'm trying to see if I can. I'm on my computer right now. See if I can find my the list only, of whether I voted Beckham or not. Is, was David Beckham in your 25? I'm That's sure what I'm was. trying to remember. It was such a lot here. Uh, <laughs> goodness <laughs> sakes. Can by I find way, this thing somewhere? While, while, while you're looking. By stall the way, for a not, second. Yeah, KJ, just add, stall for me. By the way, we should add Nico Ladero wasn't part of the nominees. Can you believe that? Over 130 players on the nomination nomination. And well, and, and I very deliberately said I'm not going to vote for any current players, with the exception okay. of like Kyle Beckerman. Like that was I, th this was a, a sort of arbitrary way of saying, okay, we need to sort of check back and and go right. through the history and um, That's try fair. to see. I'm almost certain that I did vote for David Beckham because That's I fine. think you don't need to be fully certain. Just almost certain is fine yeah. to break the tie. I'll, yeah. I'll accept that. 
I, I think <laughs> listen, we can have a half hour conversation about David Beckham because he becomes so blown up as a figure, as a personality. You almost go too far the other side. Where, oh, but he wasn't that great of a player. No, he was a great player. You don't just walk into Alex Ferguson's dressing room at Manchester United. You don't just walk onto the field at Real Madrid. And he did remarkable things in MLS. And undoubtedly, he's the most significant personality signing to, to push MLS forward. So while I have no problem whatsoever with good banter at David Beckham's expense, <laughs> and I'm interested to see what's going to happen here with Miami, because even yeah. before the season started, I was like, I don't know here. Um He's he's one of the most important players this league's ever seen. He just is. That he is. You're right. He just for me was wasn't one of the best 25 <laughs> players. <That's right. laughs> Darrow was as well. I absolutely voted for him. Yeah, there you good. Go. Well, I'm good. glad you said that, John, because he's good about stuff. to join us on the show. John, <laughs> appreciate you taking. I know how I'm busy back. it is on an MLS Cup week uh, with all the prep and everything you have to do ahead of the game. So uh, appreciate it. Have a safe flight, and we look forward to hearing your call on TSN Coast to Coast in Canada on the weekend. Thanks we miss so you much. guys. We miss Canada. Uh, I'm thrilled we're going to be international this week. Uh, thanks for having us on. Thanks, John. Really John Strong, you. the voice of uh, MLS on Fox. He will be calling the game. Columbus and Seattle MLS Cup goes on uh, Saturday night live coast to coast on TSN. Now, we joke a little bit about David Beckham there in the MLS 25 greatest. There were always going to be players who uh, maybe should have been on, weren't on. Shalry Joseph was one that I, I think a lot of people felt for what he did with the New England Revolution should have got a shout in that list of 25 and didn't. Uh, but someone I think who... Um, there were two people connected with TFC. Uh, there were actually more people connected with TFC. Preki was on there, former TFC head coach. Robin Fraser now in Colorado was Greg Vanny's assistant for a while. But we knew Javinko would be on and should be on. And we knew that this next guest would be on and should be on as well. Uh, delighted to be joined on Footy Talks by Canadian soccer legend, four-time MLS Cup winner, and one of the 25 greatest in MLS as the league celebrates its 25th anniversary. Dwayne De Rosario uh, is with us on Footy Talks today. Dero, how are you? How are you guys doing? Can you hear me? We yeah, can. Great, great to be with you. With you today, um, thanks for some reason. I'm, for not, I'm, not, I'm not hearing you guys. He's not hearing us. Can you hear us now? I'm not here. I'm not hearing you guys at all. Okay, we can hear you. I, I was you. hearing you guys, and now I can't hear you. All right, well, maybe we'll just reset there and then get him back on for a second. But uh, okay, yeah, yeah but you're right. There was, never a, there was never a doubt, was there not? In a ballot, like for those of us who took the time to vote. You know, if, you know, there was uh, there was never a, never a problem for me that just sliding his name across from one side to the other as we had to do. For me, it was easy. It was like a, 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 a not even a thought process. And you put a lot of thought into these things and to recognize history. But what Dwayne De Rosario accomplished in Major League Soccer was an absolute no doubter for me. You know, it's a, a pleasure to to see him get recognized as well. And and I think for people on this chat that they would have loved to see him you know, with that TFC shirt when he was recognized because it could have been a, a, a two or three of them, right? So in terms of where he would have been honored. The other thing that happened this week was the MLS MVP award going to Alejandro Pozuelo. Um, I don't think there was too much doubt that Pozuelo was going to win it, KJ, but in the end, it was quite a significant margin as he got just over 35% of the vote, and that was double the percentage of the next person uh, that was there, Diego Rossi, uh, who got just over 17%, I think it was. Were you surprised that the margin of Pozuelo's win was so big? I wasn't, no. I really wasn't. I just felt like you could sense the momentum going. There was no really, I don't think there was really a strong candidate to challenge him. I think the other ones were all kind of very similar. Rossi, Ladero, uh, Morris, Blake. You could see certain areas of certain countries giving them votes, but there was no, it was never like a head-to-head -head battle one between the other taking each other's votes off each other. So I think, you know, for me, it was ne there was never any doubt about it that it, it was going to win. I thought the momentum gathered a lot, as I said to you on TSN this week, about, um, you know, that, that, that strong run that TFC had in September, October, nine games unbeaten. Then he really took over the games a lot, scoring crucial goals at crucial times. And I think it's recognition as well, is it not for the club and for the organisation that what they went through to, to get that, I think that, Speaking to Pozuelo this week from Seville, it was certainly a big, strong message that he wanted to get across. Luke was that, you know, this, you know, it's an MVP award, it's an individual award, you know, and for me, in those awards, you can't really talk about them without talking about the collective anyway in the team. So I think it was very important that that they recognised that and he needed his teammates for the award. And it was nice to see him appreciate it because I know when he was asked about it in the playoffs, he's like, I don't care about the MVP, I just want to win MLS Cup, and then. I think sometime at home he recognized that it was a certainly a special award to, 
for him to receive as a player. We saw Alejandro Pozuelo make an impact in year one with TFC, despite the fact he was coming in having not had a break and, and played um, all that time straight through from the season in Belgium into Major League Soccer. 12 goals, 12 assists. This year, he comes back 23 games. Um, you know, the, the stats speak for themselves in terms of what he was able to achieve. He also developed off the field. And when you talk to a lot of the players and management within TFC, they talk about him becoming more of a leader within the locker room. Um, and and so playing playing a, a much different role, um, an, an elevated role within that locker room from year one to year two. We've seen him even even with uh, the, the time off that he had for the lockdown. I think he was fitter. He was he was more ready to go in better shape. Yeah. For the season. Um, is there another level, or do you think now it's about maintaining what we've seen from Alejandro Pozuelo? I think there's another level. I think I think the team is another level in the team. I think, you know, whether that be playing more games at home, whether that be a different voice, whether that be a few more different players coming in, I think the team needs to collectively get a little bit quicker and faster and fitter, um, bring more tempo. We're going to watch Seattle Sounders on Saturday night. Anyone who watched them on Monday can see the different level that they're playing at with TFC. And I think Pozuelo can get to that a different mentality a little bit. He spoke about that. Those are the words he used for me. In my interview, I think he can go to another level. And I think, you know, a motivated Pozuelo with those players and those kind of technicians around him, uh, whether it be a new number nine or whether it be a new attacking winger, uh, can certainly help him take him to that level as well. But you're right. The the off-the-field leadership stuff is really important. It's part of not just being what you uh, the, the player that you are on the field. And, you know, he, he's bought into the collective. And <clears throat> that's the key, you know, as an individual player, how do you get them to believe into the team and not just think about themselves? And, that's a, a major reason why Pozuelo has developed. He's not like Javinko. Javinko thought, certainly thought about the team, but Javinko was, I think, more of a selfish player, and I mean that in a strong way. I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, Pozuelo is a little bit more uh, you know, selfless on the field, um, and, but he can do his own way as well. He can damage, you know, do his own damage in his own way, not like Javinko. And you know, five years after number 10 in red got the MVP, another number 10 in the red got the MVP. So it was um, interesting to see. Well, also next year, moving forward, that leadership is going to be very important given the fact that there will be a new coach coming in, a new structure to the team, um, given the departure of Greg Vanny. So it'll be interesting to see um, whether that continues uh, with Alejandro Pozuelo moving forward. But certainly the MLS MVP, the second time that a Canadian has won it, a Canadian team has won it, the second time, uh, obviously, that um, it's been a Toronto FC player with Sebastian Jovinko back in 2015. Um Interesting on that year as well, in 2015, when Jovinko won MLS MVP, um, they didn't win a playoff game that year either because they no. lost against Montreal. And then this year, they get the MVP award with Pozuelo as well and, and get knocked out in round one. Yeah, some synergy there, isn't there? I don't think TFC fans would like that too much. I think that we saw, I certainly saw, was it yesterday that was the three-year anniversary from when winning the Cup in 2017? There was a lot of energy and a lot of excitement on social media about where people were that night. And I think you know, the 2017 trophy will always be a lot more special than winning these MVP awards because that's for me is, you know, that's why I've never been a big fan of individual awards is that it's nice for the individual and I understand why they care about it and we vote and I take it seriously. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, fans care about, you know, winning trophies, you know, like, you know, I'm like a huge Atlanta Braves fan in baseball. My player this year, Freddie Freeman, won the National League MVP and I was delighted for Freddie and his family and he was in tears when he won it. That's great. But it doesn't do anything for me in terms of my team winning something, you know. And I won nothing again. Well, it came close, you know. So, but yeah. So, you know, it's uh, that's the thing, and that's what drives TFC fans. They'll be delighted at Pozuelo winning MVP, but they'll be they'll be adamant that their team goes on another level and says, "Don't get complacent here. Evaluate the team properly. How are we going to get better? How are we going to build around Pozuelo? Pozuelo's two years into a four-year deal. How are we going to keep him happy?" Is it a time to give him another contract now? I will probably go against that right now, give him another year uh, and give him an opportunity to flourish again and really see the true Pozuelo fit and ready to go, hopefully, uh, in home stadiums. Although we'll have to wait and see, as Don Garber said this week in his, in his message to the league. Who knows what is going to happen when uh, Major League Soccer kicks off and how that will affect the Canadian teams as well moving forward to next season. Uh, I think we've got D-Row back. Um, Let's see if we can join him. Uh, he can join us now once more. Dwayne De Rosario with us, so one of MLS 25 greatest, and of course, uh, legend for Canada as well. But looking very much like a black screen right now. That that white wheel of death. No, it's not looking good. Are you there, Dero? Can you hear us? Hello, guys. How are you? 
Ah, yeah. We can hear you. We just we can't can see you right we now. We just can't see you right now. Uh, but... I, I, I'm sorry. I know it's a difficult time um, with, with with the Wi-Fi and everything. And um, you know, you still you're still sounding a little choppy. But I'll try my best uh, for, for the fans, everybody tuning in now. Um, always great to to see you guys and and to be on the program. Great. I want to ask you then about this week, about what your thoughts were when it came out. We all thought it was a no doubter anyway. You getting named in the top twenty five, but how nice was that to get the recognition about being named MLS greatest 25 players? Yes. Yeah, so, sorry. So I'm just going to try to make up what you guys are saying because it's extremely choppy on my end, but um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely humbled and honored to be selected um, as part of MLS top 25 uh, to be on that um, list uh, as a, as a, as a, as a inner city Scarborough Metro Housing Kid is um, is is a, a testament to, to hard work and, and the support that I've gotten from my family, in particular my brothers. And shout out my brothers! It's their birthday yesterday and today, and uh, my my father's who passed away this year. His birthday is today, so it's a it's a it's a again a day of uh, mixed emotions for me. But um, I'm grateful to be uh, on this list of 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 what I uh, a lot of players I look up to as as legends. Uh, and to represent Canada and represent my community, and hopefully I could be a, um, a, an inspiration for other young kids that uh, are growing up in similar situations that them too could could achieve their dreams. Have you got one moment, Dero, that stands out from your time in MLS more than any other? Sorry, have you got one moment that stands out from your MLS career more than any of the any of the others? Um, I, I, again, sorry, sorry, I can't, I can't hear. I can't hear, hear clearly at all. But um, um, I, 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 all I hear is that at what moment? One moment. One moment from your MLS career, compared to I know you um, won four MLS cups, but is there one that is the the best moment you had in MLS that comes to your mind immediately when you think about it? I'm trying to do my best to lips, uh, re lips, <laughs> re lips there. But um, you know, I, I think I think. Um, I don't know if you asked me what moment in my career really stands out, but, um, you, you know, I'm very fortunate and blessed to, to have a, a lot of special moments. Obviously, the 2001 MLS Cup was my first real uh, mark in, in the MLS and my real stamp, uh, my name. Uh, and, um, you know, winning back-to-back -back with Houston. But, uh, you know, for me, coming back home to Toronto was, was extremely special moment for me. You see, 2007, the, the inaugural season and, and, and the passion and the, and the love and the support that was rallied around um, TFC was, was amazing. And to, to come to TFC in 2009 to be a part of that and to help them win their first championship for me was a, a, a memorable night and, and one that... Um, you know, I always cherish and and to go back to back and win that win a trophy for them. And obviously, twenty seventeen was the icing on the cake with with MLS Cup and to be a part of the organization, to be a, be a part of that movement was, was definitely special. D, D Row, tell us about your book coming out next year. I'm really excited about it. Tell us about it. So, um, Sarah, can you say it again? Yeah, tell tell us about your book. Next season, next year is coming out. Your book. Let's let's try some sound. Your book. Um, yes, I'm I'm coming out with a book. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate. It. I don't know why I can't hear you guys at all. Like I, I can't even hear you. But um, I'll try my best. I am coming up with a book. It, it, it's coming out a, a biography about my life. Um, it was very difficult writing it. Um, obviously, you go through a lot of emotions. You touch on topics that you've I've never exposed. I've always been a private guy. I've always just shared my passion for the game and my community. Other than that, I haven't really, um, you know, shared my my private life. So to to expose my upbringing and some of my trials and tribulations growing up again, um, it, it's an aim to one tell my story and my truth, and, and two to inspire. You know, kids growing up and, and people growing up with challenges and difficult moments and how you could overcome that with the proper mindset to achieve anything that you put your mind to. One more thing before we go, and I don't, I don't know if Kev, producer Kev, if you could put along the bottom of the screen, maybe D-Row can hear. Um, maybe D-Row can read what the question is, because he mentioned back in 2009 about uh, Toronto FC's first trophy. Just write, producer Kev, you, if you can write Miracle in Montreal on the bottom of the screen there, just to see if D-Row can can pick that one up and then we can just finish by talking about that because he did mention that moment. Dero, can you see that? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the Miracle of Montreal was, again, was, was, was very, very special, you know, to, to be a part of that team. And, you know, I remember, you know, the game in Vancouver, um, you know, I, I came to the locker room. I was so mad with, with the team and myself and, you know, our performance was, was, wasn't up to par. And um, I almost broke the, my foot kicking through a cooler. I, I kicked my right through a, a cooler and the whole water and ice splashed all in the locker room. I was so angry and I was really angry at myself first because I, I felt like I let, I let our team down and second because of our performance. And I made sure that on, on that whole um, flight home, it, it was plaguing in my mind. And, you know, I said, in Montreal, I'm going to give everything I got. I'm going to put it all in the field. And, um, you know, when I heard that um, Vancouver was there to celebrate, I lost it. That's when I was like, there's no way. Like, you know, they're they're here to celebrate and they're thinking that they've they've already um accomplished this. I'm gonna I'm gonna paint a, a different picture. And from day one, um from from leading up to that game, my focus was was set on 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 you know getting the team to believe that we could win that game and we played like we could. Um obviously um auto coming out and, and, and scoring that world class free kick as well helped and Chad um providing providing his goal towards the end. It was it was monumental for the club and I think for 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 again for to win our first trophy was was amazing. D Row, we'll leave there. Thank you for being with us today. Um, a difficult situation trying to, to 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 chat when you can't hear us, but we made the best of it. All the best. Uh, congratulations on being in the MLS uh, Greatest Twenty Five. Thanks, D Row. Thanks, D Row. Thank Bye. you guys. Appreciate it. again. Sorry for the uh, the, the the noise, <laughs> but uh, you know I always appreciate you guys. Again, um, thank you for the fans who voted. Thank you for my teammates who supported me. Thank you for you guys, the media, the sports. Um, and, you know, again, Canada, again, we're, we're, we're doing special things on the global scale. And um, beautiful time to, to be Canadian. Um, it's just a proud moment for me and a passionate moment for me. So thank you, guys. Thanks, d -Row. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can't chat longer. Lots of things that we could have got into there with D-Row, including Canada and obviously what's going on uh, with some of the young talent coming through. But um, I've run out of props and, and way to... <laughs> <laughs> you did well there, yeah. mate. We if, I, if I'd got a pen, I could have actually written questions down. I, I was going to do that next. I was going. I wasn't going to lie. I had that thought. I'm, you know me. I'm always a pen and paper guy. Uh, you know, we're both like we're both parents here. We're both adopting like different strategies. How you get there? You know, like yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's uh, why, boy, boy, oh boy, that was a strange one. But yeah, if anybody else has got any questions for us, by the way, just send them in now. With the last ten minutes of the show, we'll. We got, a, we got about 10 more minutes. As long as yeah. the question isn't where it's Caldwell, because we don't know. We, yeah. can't, we can't answer that. Yeah. Um, but but Dero there talks about that night. You tend to forget. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe it gets blocked out of the mind because of the fact that those 07 to 15 didn't bring much joy. But that everyone starts to think about TFC being successful in 2015. Yeah. But that first, that first. Canadian Championship back in 2009 and that it's called Miracle in Montreal for a reason with with the way that they played that night um and the way it all went down against that impact team um that that's one of the the key moments in TFC history isn't it I mean it, it, it gets overlooked because of the the recent success but that first trophy as Dero talked about there um you know he's talking about a career in Major League Soccer where he has won so much all-stars MLS Cups um, goals of the year, uh, one of the best players in the league's history. And, and that moment and coming home to TFC in 2009 still is up there with everything else he achieved. Yeah, for me, it signifies so much about the sport that we cover. You know, there's been a, the way we are right now in the modern day era, the way we cover this game. And you know me, I've just been working the last couple of days for Sirius on the UEFA Champions League. And we're in this era now of celebrating teams that get into European spots or celebrating teams if you make the Champions League. And it's like no one can take away nothing, no fourth spot to secure a spot in the next tournament or to get to a spot in the Canadian Championship or, or Champions League. Nothing can, can get away with that emotion and that feeling of lifting that trophy. That's what I think about with that game. First of all, I think about where I was and when I, when I saw the scores coming through, I'm like, whoa. You never forget that. We all see the sporting events. Like, is this really going to happen? And then I think about those players actually lifting the trophy, you know, that day. And TFC fans who are joining us here, and many of them that I've spoken to over the years from the start, that their first real memory of positivity after the winning the first game and the cushions all on the field, that's the feeling of, oh, oh, okay, that's what it's like to win something. You know, we, you know it's like... 
okay, the team wasn't very good, but they did what they needed to do, and it took a long time afterwards. But that was the sense of belonging that I talked about last week and about to win that game and win that something. And then add it on top, the extra spice, which is a beauty spice, is that you beat those guys that you don't like. That's even better. If you can win a trophy and you beat the team you don't like, that's better as well, isn't it? That, that suits it. So add a little bit of that as well. And as you said, the fact that Vancouver would, you know, be in the stands and then watching that, and then you can get it, stick it to both teams as well. So, uh, yeah, it was nice. He just sent me a message, actually, apologizing to all the fans. Don't know what happened there, but would love to jump, jump on again soon. So um, nice to hear from Dero. Maybe, maybe the uh, just before his book comes out, we can we can get Dero back on once again. Yeah, and our friend, friend Brendan Dunlop, who wrote the book, we, can, we both can come on. And then if one of them can't actually hear us, <laughs> the other one can. <laughs> um, a question in the chat uh, for Jeff C against TFC predictions. We were just talking about the fact that um, uh, the Miracle in Montreal was a Canadian Championship game, of course. Forge the other night lost in their final chance to get into the Champions League, the CONCACAF League uh, play-in game, uh, which now means that the Canadian Championship is going to have the significance of whoever wins it goes into the CONCACAF Champions League. Mm. Um, we don't know when it'll be played. We don't know under what conditions it will be played, in which stadium it will be played, which month of the year it will be played. Which uh, it'll be played in. We do know it has to be played now before the CONCACAF Champions League gets underway because this is going to decide who goes into the CONCACAF Champions League. Um, would have been a lot easier for everyone if Forge had been able to get through in the CONCACAF League and that position then had gone to TFC from the Canadian Championship. Yeah. Uh, but they'll have to play the game and it will be a meaningful game and it will be a game where TFC likely under new management, uh, first game that they'll, they'll have played. Um, so it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because Forge... Although they're coming off what will be um, a couple of months where they've had an off season, they're very well oiled under under Bobby Smyrniotis, and they'll have a lot of a lot more stability in terms of management there than TFC will have. Yeah, and nobody will give them a chance, and they'll love that. You know, they love that because they, you know, oh, TFC not going to lose to a CPL team. Well, Whitecaps fans are still talking about that fact that they lost to Cavalry last year. It, didn't, it doesn't go down well. Trust me. I'm not saying anything about bad about the CPL because they deserve the respect that they got. It felt so bad for Forge, so close, you know. Um, you know, weren't really outplayed again this week and just kind of figured that we couldn't get over the line. But yeah, it'd be fun. It'll be, I think it's obviously going to be happening, obviously, in probably February, if they can try and get it in before that. And I know the CONCAF Champions League comes quite, pretty soon after that. The other thought is this is that, you know, it's Toronto FC's new boss, whoever that will be, will get a chance to win their trophy in their first ever game. <laughs> yeah. First ever game, you know? I mean, how often does that happen? I know sometimes in the UK, you get a team coming and you take over a team and you go to the charity, Community Shield, as it's called now, um, you know, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, that doesn't, doesn't count. That doesn't, doesn't count. It doesn't count for me. Pep Guardiola counts it as long as of, of his many of many titles, as he calls them. Him and Mourinho call them titles and add Community Shield to it, which is utter nonsense. But, um, you know, it doesn't count. But this counts. This is a domestic cup. This is the trophy. Um, so what a chance that will be for the first... Uh, TFC boss to either go up well and get a trophy or uh, conversely on this side, the first match of their chart that that the era in charge of Toronto FC will be uh, getting beat by a CPL team. So it's either high or very low threats from the start. Uh, let's wrap up the show by uh, just looking ahead to MLS Cup this weekend. We we heard from John Strong and, and got into it a little bit earlier on Columbus and Seattle. But uh, what about you, KJ? Who's your money on heading into the final this weekend? Uh, I don't have any money to put on anybody, so I will. <laughs> um, I, I think, I think for me, I lean on Seattle just a little bit. Although you know, for me, Columbus have got a great shout here. Home advantage is massive, isn't it? I mean, we've seen it last year in Seattle. I know the fans were a big part of that last year. We're going to have some fans there. Um, twenty eighteen in Atlanta, we were there. The fans were an enormous part of that game. Twenty seventeen, Toronto FC. Twenty sixteen, the home advantage has been has been big. Uh, so I do think that will help Columbus. But as I said, if Seattle play the level that they can reach where they played the last 20 minutes in that game, where they played it against LAFC and where I consistently see them play this season, they if they reach that level, they'll win. Uh, and, and I think that that will be interesting for me to see whether they can reach that level. As John quite rightly said, it's one game, it's a final. They're never always brilliant games to watch. It's going to be cold, miserable, wet. Um, but that won't bother Seattle, by the way. They're used to playing in the rain. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that they should be favourites. But this Columbus team make it nasty. They're a difficult team to break down. They've got a good midfield. Nagby and Arto protect really well. Um, they win a lot of second balls. They're quite direct, even though Zella Rayan's a true number 10. They're still quite direct in their attack to, to, 
Jesse Zardes as well. So it'll be fun. It'll be a really good game, Luke. I'm really looking forward to covering it with you and, and watching it. Remember in um, 2011, 12, 13, 14, when the Galaxy won three times in four years and it was the Donovan, Beckham, Janino, Savas, Omar mm. Gonzalez was part of that as well. Um, for me, when you look back on teams from the past, that's the one that stands out from the time I've been following MLS very closely since 2007. And, and that was head and shoulders above anything else that I've seen. Um, I'm not talking about the last last two or three years, but like from, from that early decade of TFC's existence, it's that every time you went to, into a game against that Galaxy team, you knew that it was going to be tough and, and they, they got what they deserved under the leadership of Bruce Arena there. Now this is a Seattle side with a chance to win a third in five years. Um, they've been to, to MLS Cup 16, 17, 19, 20. Um, how close are they to that Galaxy side? Or, or I know it's difficult comparing teams that are six, seven, eight years apart. Um, do you actually think the Sounders now have more quality than that Galaxy side had? I do. I do think they have more quality. I think they are in that conversation to be the best team ever. I really do, regardless of what happens on the weekend. The opposition that they face week in, week out is, is stronger now than it was with that Galaxy team. Take nothing away from that Galaxy team, as, right, as you rightly said. They were the dominant force. Uh, but I do think now that the level of quality in Major League Soccer is is, is far higher, if not far superior um, as well. And uh, the quality that they brought in, the recruitment there as well. So, you know, for me, the other thing too is that now, you know, you're playing one-legged games in these playoffs. That, it, not, not two legs. You know, where really the elite teams will always get through. To win games consistently like that in knockout competitions like last year and this year in just one-off games is something really special. Things can go against you pretty quickly in a game that could have happened last, in the last game for them, but they still find ways to get through that. And I think that adds as well for me to the, to the fact that they are, as I said, arguably one of not one of the greatest teams in the, in the, in the 25 year history of the sport. We'll leave it there for this week's Footy Talks. I hope everybody enjoys MLS Cup. Of course, it is live on TSN on a Saturday night, Columbus against Seattle. And we will be back next Thursday for the final Footy Talks of an incredible 2020. We'll look back on MLS Cup. We'll look back on the year. Uh, some of our highlights from doing this show as well since uh, everything kicked off back in March. Season um, reviews are always fun, Luke, right? Season reviews with Christmas special, season reviews. I might even do a little bit of a quiz, not for you, but for everybody else maybe. Yeah, yeah. no, no. I'm, my, I used to I used to know everything, like all the stats. Every, I was an absolute encyclopedia. And now it's like if I haven't written it down or got it in front of me, that's what happens when you're well, over 40, right? It's, well, that's what happens. You're getting older just as you had a birthday this week. So a belated happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put it on social media. I didn't embarrass you. I've got lots of pictures on my phone. I right, yeah, yeah. That. Don't worry. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. You're a good friend. Okay. Uh, thanks to everyone for being with us. Thanks, Free everybody. Talks presented by Powerade. We'll see you again next Thursday at 12.30. Enjoy MLS Cup.